So thank you, uh, Dean Francisco Rodriguez, Dean, Dean Paco, for, for the invitation. And thank you, Professor Bros, for having me here, you know, via distance. It's a pleasure to join all of you. And I hope uh, I will make a kind of a, I will make a presentation on the themes, you know, related to politics and, and, and public space. And, and uh, you know, I'll show kind of a number of projects. But I, I want to, I would like to preface sort of that, uh, the presentation with with a couple of things that that have to do with how and why I'm addressing this issue that that you know I think it, it's critical uh, that has to do with memory and space memory and architecture and uh, what you will see you know throughout the lecture and I'm going to sort of uh, see if you could see the screen yeah okay so what I'd like to do today is to share with you a few things among them, uh, ways in which I'm, I'm approaching this issue of memory and space, memory and architecture. What I will show is a lot of images that will go kind of quite quickly as a back, back, backdrop for the presentation. And then I will center a bit, bit more of my attention on the project for France for the Memorial to the Abolition of Slavery, which you see illustrated here. But when we think of memory, we can address it from cognitive questions, from cultural and religious traditions, we can also look at the question of personal memory, the idea of collective memory, the relation between history and memory. We can also address it from the perspective of what it is to, to have a memory or a habit memory, which is what we do on, a, on our daily lives. You know, how do we remember that a pen is called a pen and how do we address, you know, how do we think about that? You know, in psychoanalysis, there was a lot of work you know, on issues of memory and working through trauma and history, tra traumatic uh, events and in, in our own lives. We can also relate the issue of memory to the question of temporality, you know, and memory is also passive to be sort of distorted. Uh, so what I'm trying to suggest is that memory is a very, very large topic, you know, and we have, you know, association of memory studies, you know, and many other scholars working on this issue from all kinds of perspectives. Uh, what I would try to do today is to suggest you know sort of ways in which I personally try to approach this idea of memory as an action, memory as an action, both from practice and pedagogy as well. Uh, so uh, basically, when I think of memory, you know, I would like to sort of suggest that the act of remembering is of the present and is referenced in the past and thus absent, as Andreas Hoysen suggests to us. I'm interested in thinking about memory as an action, not as an object, not as a noun. As an action, to remember is to be present, is to say, here we are. And with uh, Argentinian writer Jorge Luis Borges, I also would like to suggest that memory, as, as, as Borges wrote you know, in that short story called Funes el Memorioso, he said, my memory, sir, is like a garbage heap. That means that we have to understand and to excavate and to distill what memories, what can we find, you know, in that pile of garbage, let's put it this way. But, but our aspiration is to remember, to be witnesses, to bear witness to past and present complex histories, not only in our, in our, I mean, not in, the, in, our, in, our, in our present, but also obviously in our past. But, but to understand the idea of being present, to consider our work as academics, as architects, historians, is to include truth seeking, you know, to think about, you know, plights of humanity today in our present, such as the question of traffic, human traffic in the present. So we need to think of ourselves as, 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 as fearless speakers, as fearless participants in, in our society, you know, in, 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 against this ongoing plights, you know, human, human plights like human trafficking, genocides, you know, and present day slavery as well. Uh, because partly what we are trying to suggest with these kinds of work, you know, memory maps that my students do, you know, sort of part of what we're trying to suggest is, is, is with Emmanuel Levinas, is that our, as members of society, we need to figure out and understand how do we possess, position ourselves. And with Levinas, he suggests that society is the miracle of moving out of oneself. This idea of moving out of oneself is key for all what we're going to see this afternoon. And I think it's key for our work as architects and as young architects as well. So I'm thinking about commitment to remembering, you know, and creating new kinds of memorial institutions. You know, 
I think of memorials as psychopolitical and ethical companions that should function as environments for thinking past and present and encouraging new critical consciousness, new critical consciousness in search for memory. This is in Paris. Materials of the Memorial to the Evolution of Slavery in France. So in a certain way, you know, as you will see a few projects uh, as backdrop, you know, I'm trying to suggest that remembering is a vital activity and shapes our relation with the past and defines our present and future. But memory is selective. You know, memory is also related, you know, to the question of construction, repression, and denial. You know, memories are slippery, imperfect, impermanent, and they are textured. They are unstable, and they are always subject to distortions. So we have to think about those traces of the past, because memory, in its many forms, is a marker in our contemporary world. Few words are so ubiquitous as the word memory. So even though these are some of the projects that my students do at Roger Williams, you know, the memory boxes, uh, so, so when we think of, of spaces and public spaces and history and memory, we begin to see that traces of the past are still present in our present. We can see as well that the atrocities, crimes and disasters of the recent and, and a bit longer past have been inscribed in our consciousness in many ways. Slavery, apartheid, genocides, crimes against humanity mark the way we see the world mark the way we see the world. Few cities in the United States, Europe, South America, or, or, or Asia, you know, do without those kinds of spaces that are dedicated to some form of commemoration. But an important aspect of this culture of memory is the way that the struggle for justice and human rights and the remembrance of traumatic events have been coupled as nations seek to create democratic societies in the wake of mass extermination apartheid, slavery, segregation, military dictatorships, you know, and the likes. So we see the construction of these kinds of memorials that are significant not only in their number, but in the significant they hold for affected communities, the significant that they hold for affected communities. So when I stop for a second here, this is a, in, a, in, the, in the city of Minsk in Belarus. You may have heard that they are trying to sort of rise against, you know, dictator Lukashenko at this, this, at this very juncture. But in 1994, when they regained a small form of democracy or a very limited democracy, in this particular place in Minsk, started, you know, at night, many crosses started to appear. More crosses and more crosses and more crosses. Every night, more crosses. There's around, at least when I was there for a, part, for a project that we had in 2008, uh, there were, they said there were around 10,000 crosses or more. And the crosses had no names. So they were marking the place where the Stalinist government in the 30s killed their ancestors. That means that the site itself is embedded in a kind of memory or a kind of, a, you know, sort of a, what we could call a loaded history, a very complex history that in generations after generations had to be marked. And, 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 and this is why people brought crosses to this place in Belarus. So what I'm trying to suggest is that it's very significant to think about this, the, the, the meaning you know, of these memories and how this, what we could call microhistories or histories of individuals can articulate themselves and participate of public space. Public space is a word that we use a lot. And when we think of monuments and we think of monumental space, and when we think of the public space of the city, we usually mean, or, it's, or it is usually meant, um, a kind of space that reserved for, the, reserved for the celebration of the history of victors. That means that it forgets the nameless and the vanquished, the victims, witnesses, and survivors of today's and yesterday's crimes and injustices. So it is important to understand then that the success of democracy and indeed of democratic public space, we could argue that can be measured by its capacity to encourage and assist in the process of disruption of the continuity of the history of victors. Again, disrupting the continuity of history of victors. You know, and that can happen also by the tradition or the memory of the vanquished through political, cultural, spatial, and artistic means. What I want to suggest here is that if we follow Hannah Arendt, you know, uh, the, the kind of a political philosopher 
from New York or from, I mean, from Europe that taught at Columbia in the 50s, she suggested that political equality means visibility. Conversely, political inequality and invisibility go hand in hand. So we have to consider how do we address this? Let me just stop for a second and, and, and mention a little bit about the work that we do with Christoph Odichko, who's an artist, you know, Polish artist. So we are not only an architect and an artist team, but are people whose ancestors suffered, you know, in a certain way, very complex histories, I would call. He is a Polish Jew that was born in hiding at the time of the Warsaw Ghetto, and his father was a war slave. I am an American-Argentinian Jew, and my mother was born in Berlin in 1936 and fled Germany, you know, late in 1938. So when I, this, this is where basically the kind of furniture store of my great-grandparents, you know, in, in, in Berlin that they have to leave behind, and the passage that some of the family were able to take, you know, to go to South America. So, and I grew up, you know, studying architecture, you know, under dictatorship in Buenos Aires, you know, and these are you know, our fellow students that basically were killed, the desaparecidos, you know, by the military, by the state-sponsored terrorism. And we call them, this is the center, court, the center court of the School of Architecture in Buenos Aires, and there's a banner that, tell, that tells us siempre presentes, always present. And it's very important to consider this, you know, the, the kind of the presence of those others in our lives, you know. And, and what I want to emphasize with this is the following. It's not that I mentioned these biographical notes to suggest that, that these kinds of notes give any kind of le legitim legitimacy to the work that I do. Actually, the reason I suggest this is that through our collective work, we feel obliged to contribute to the visibility of those whose history and memory have been relegated to the margins. That is, what we are trying to suggest is that our position is to help the visibility of others, help others be visible in public space. So when we think of public space and when we think of memory, and we, we can think of monuments and the word monuments and aid of laws at the beginning of the 20th century suggested that only a small part of architecture belongs to art, the sepulcher and the monument. What he meant to assert was that art takes place in the idea of a sepulcher and a monument the idea of a place of exception that life has led up to, you know, a place of exception. I want to emphasize this idea, place of exception. The Latin word monumentum derives from the verb moneo, and it means to warn, to remind, and to advise. To warn, to remind, and to advise. If we think this way, we may perceive that instead of a form, a shape, or an image, monumentality may well be a quality, a quality that some places or objects may have to make us recall, evoke, and think something beyond themselves, something beyond themselves. The significance of these projects lies in the public dimension and dialogic character of memorial space. That is a space between the stories told and the events remembered. This is the quilt memoria, the AIDS quilt memoria, basically a temporary transformation of the mall in Washington, you know, with quilts that were dedicated to each of the, uh, the, the, uh, our fellow humans who died of AIDS in the 80s and 90s. We can also think that the, 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 the Museum of uh, Nas National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C., that opened a few, a few years ago, is not just a building, it's an inscription of, public of, 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 of presence in our public spaces. You know, the project in Nantes is not just the transformation of the waterfront, but it's a, trans a marker of in our public life. You know, those would be called, or I could call them, affirmations of memory in public space. So when we think of these projects, you know, we have to think about the questions that are not merely architectural, artistic, or, 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 or historic, but they are moral and ethical and political at the same time, ethical and political at the same time. So how do we understand the critical significance of design and action, you know, when we conceive and create these kinds of projects, democratic public spaces? How do we think, you know, how we can contribute to elaborate, you know, what we could call the ethical implications of Hannah and description of public space or public sphere as the space for appearance, the space of appearance? 
how do we position ourselves as designer, as architects, as thinkers? Architecture is inherently, you know, a pub practical and a public art, a practical and a public art. It is a practical art insofar that purpose is the driving force. Why a work calls in, be, is called into being. So when I'm thinking about architecture, I think of this idea of a practical art and a public art. It is a public art in that the presence of the work, the presence itself, constructs the space for public appearance. It involves always the poetic reorganization of matter to form purposeful, inhabitable space. Architecture occurs at the as a transformation of topography. It always works against its context, you know, always is foreign and is always connected to ideas of exile and temporality. You know, projects and buildings, temporality, projects and buildings, while being catalysts for the process of memory, bring forth what I would like to say, suggest is the depth of continuity, as well as the desire for ethical transformations. Projects and buildings create conversations or establish conversations in space and time. And they permit for us to inhabit have it the distance between act and remembrance, act and remembrance. This window that you have seen a few times is a conversation with a building that exists on the other side of the Loire River in the memorial for, to the abolition of slavery, a conversation, an opening, a window that cuts the wall of the 18th century, about nine feet thick wall, and opens a view to a building on the other side, which is the Palace of Justice by architect Jean Nouvel. So we decided to establish that kind of spatial conversation in, you know, that happens from the memorial of you to justice or to the palace of justice. Conversation in space and times. These are images of houses that I design as well. Kind of an existing brick wall and a continuity of windows. Again, conversations in space and time. So the architect's historic role has been to create a theater for action of memory that makes possible to affirm life and contemplate a better future. And I would like at this particular point to invite all of us to do a very short exercise on memory. Because, you know, as architects, when I show you this window on the right that I designed and I show you the window or you see the window on the left, it's a window that I saw in the kind of walled city of Aigues Mortes in France. And suddenly when I was designing this window, I tried to recall, where did I see it? Where did I see it? And it came to my mind that I have seen this window before. So what I'm trying to suggest here is that we have a repository of memories and of spaces that we have inhabited and visited, and we have to make use of it. So at this point, I'd like to invite all of you to think of one event in your lives for five seconds, one significant event in your life for five seconds, if you can picture it, something significant, I hope you have it in your mind. And now to stay in the space in which that event took place for 10 seconds and try to observe the qualities of that space, the material, the heftiness, the light, you know, people for 10 seconds. Stay there. So if you, as you've done this exercise on memory, you have you know, acted upon almost like memory again as an action, you know, not as an object. You have acted and you have remembered something special that belongs to each and every one of you. That's the kind of thing that I'm always trying to emphasize both as teacher and as an architect and as a colleague and as a human being, that we have to use our memories to invite ourselves to be part of our society. That means again, architecture is about affirmation of life and contemplation of a better future. We imagine projects and embark in journeys that leave traces over the skin of the earth. You know, and we look at light, and we look at materials, and we look at spaces, and we look at memories. You know, again, we connect you know, history and memory all the time. So our work often lies in uncovering as well as anchoring histories and memories on territories, cities, and sites. And cities are based on, the, on this idea of community construction or construction about community. And Louis Kahn suggested to us long time ago that the street is a room by agreement, a community room, the walls of which belong to the donors and its ceiling is the sky. This beautiful idea, kind of the notion of a city as a community or a street as a community room, 
is what matters when we think of public spaces. You know, we think of public spaces and we think of the material, in how, how are these public spaces constructed? Again, it was Alberti who told us that pavements, grounds are a rejoice, the ground in Siena and the ground at the memorial to the abolition of slavery, marked by those dots that you will see later. Again, transformation, you know, on hi of, over histories, cities, and sites. It is in the face of catastrophes, historic traumas, and human injustices that our work, you know, the architect's role and the artist's role becomes increasingly problematic and we only hope necessary. So when we work on these kinds of projects, you know, we have to be somehow wary of the expectation of creating instant metaphor and artificial meanings. You know, and I'm talking about the question of representation. Because according to Leo Berzani, a thinker, the catastrophes of history appear to matter much less if they are somehow compensated for in art. So again, we have to be mindful of this because neither architecture nor art can attempt to compensate public trauma or mass murder. What we can do through our practices, you know, is to establish what I call dialogic relation with traumatic events, with history and memory history and memory. And it is in this case that I want to emphasize the idea of ethical respect for the other who participates of our spaces and comes to our spaces in the hope that, we, that they will find some either solace or connection you know, or history. It's not our spaces, it's the spaces we create. Sorry about that. Let me just clarify that. So when we work on these kinds of projects, you know, we are mindful, you know, of, of, of the persistent attempt that we need to engage to transform public space and public sphere, you know, the public sphere. We have to position ourselves you know, as engaged witnesses. And this is a word that I will expand in a, in a few seconds. Witnesses, you know, very and requires precise dialogic committed attitude towards history, towards memory, you know, towards the voice of others. You may recall this image of, of uh, of Congress, Congressman John Lewis, you know, uh, you know, on the marches, you know, and we can begin to think that we have to commit ourselves to work with democracy. And this is where it starts to connect to politics. Democracy, Claude Lefort tells us, is based on uncertainty and is legitimized by the de declaration of rights, the right to declare in public space, on debate, on being present in public space. This is in Mexico in 68. And these are the marches, you know, by, by Martin Luther King, and you see Coretta Scott King over there too. So this idea of spaces that are significant in our lives, both past and present, you know, uh, make us think of those others, those others who may, we may not know, and they demand from us, you know, to understand that we participate of society. Because those others, are an enigma. Who are those others? Those others, you know, like in Catalolco, that we may not know, that's in Mexico. Those others who invite us to consider their faces, their presence in the world, you know. Those others resist possession and can never be fully known and can never be reduced to content. They are those others who are ourselves. They are visible and invisible. Those others that are faces that resist concession and cannot be reduced to content, as Emmanuel Levine has suggested. Those others that still are waiting for an ethical response. Philosophers like Giorgio Agamben have theorized the position of the witness as the basis of ethical political relations, insofar as the witness answers to the suffering of others without usurping the place of the other. The, the witness answers to the suffering of others without usurping the place of the other. That's partly what I want to emphasize here, not to usurp the place of the other. This requires, you know, witnessing requires to understand, uh, you know, kind of an acceptance that this is a way of seeing that requires an acceptance of vulnerability. It requires a renunciation of the will to mastery for as trauma theorist Cathy Carrot argues, argues to bear witness to the truth of suffering over a traumatic event 
is to bear witness to that event's incomprehensibility. The event incomprehensibility. This poses problems for all kinds of uh, representations that want to respond to the suffering of others. Here you see a silhouetazo in Plaza de Mayo that is basically the bodies, the shape of the bodies, you know, of, of marking them that disappeared, you know, with chalk and with paint in the kind of main square in Argentina, in Buenos Aires. Desaparecidos from Argentina. In Chile. In Guatemala. So perhaps what, the only thing we can do is to breathe your name, to breathe your name. You know, to breathe your name is something extremely important, is something very powerful for all of us that we have to consider. You know, and we have to consider it in the context of our own present. What does it mean to breathe today? What does it mean to be alive? And what does it mean to participate in our society? How can we transform this kind of monuments on these places? And how can we think about our own present? We should note that despite you know, our pandemic, where the other can be seen as a source of fear, the air they breathe can be contagious, we also see significant movements in an anti-racist pro protest against all form of representations of oppression and repression that take place in our cities. The Black Lives Matter movement you know, is significant not only in the US, but also in the world. This is an image of the George Floyd march at the memorial to the abolition of slavery in Nantes. So this reaffirms the significance that democratic public space has the capacity to encourage disrupting the continuity of histories of victors with a struggle for freedom and justice in our present. And that's my dear friends and colleagues, what we want to try to do. Because the questions that one asks oneself begin at least to illuminate the world and becomes, be, become one's key to the experience of others, as James Baldwin suggested. One's key to the experience of others. Again, the word freedom inscribed at the memorial to the abolition of slavery in, seven, in 47 languages. So I'm trying to suggest that with all these images that come back and repeat themselves, that we have to, the power to recall, to think. So the Holocaust Museum in Buenos Aires, the Martin Luther King Memorial as a public space, as a, a ground for activism, as we call, projections by Christoph in Tijuana, you know, and projections in Hiroshima, you know, that are a part of kind of almost like the palette, the palette of work that we have, you know, the, uh, you know that, that we want to share, or I want to share with you. Again, with Baldwin, again, the questions that one asks oneself begin at least to illuminate the world and becomes one key to the experience of others. One key to the experience of others. The memorial as a horizontal marker, the glass that emerges from the esplanade, you know, on the embankments of the 18th, 19th, and 20th century, you know, that cuts the ground and makes another kind of space visible. But also my work, and I just want to emphasize this and then I'll show you a few some more specifics on projects you know this this is what I'm trying to suggest you know as an attitude to understand and to approach the experience of others this is the attitude that I've tried to bring to my teaching to my projects and to our collaborative work and and in a certain way it's not only to 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 the work that we do but also to the work that we do as advocate. You know, I participate on conferences. I'm part of this symbolic preparations research project, you know, with the cultural and humanitarian agents, you know, uh, and, and also at the Radcliffe Institute working on universities and slavery. And I continue to do that. But I also, as I mentioned to Professor Bros, I'm also a soccer coach. You can see me there on the back. You see there, you know, there on the back. When our teams from Cambridge you know, won the state championship, two teams. And the reason I mention this is that all the work that we do as architects, as thinkers, is also as, as professors, is a way of engaging ethically with those others who we do not know and we long to know and we long to engage, you know, in fruitful conversations, be that through symbolic preparations, be that through discussions about slavery, discussions about the present, or on the soccer pitch. You know, what it means to play a game. So I'll show you briefly a few images, you know, or I continue to show you images 
of some of the projects that my students did at uh, Roger Williams University dealing with the history of Rhode Island slavery and slave trade. You know, memory maps, sites of memory, memory boxes as an exercise, you know, as, as a series of exercise mapping, you know, and thinking about not only the past but our present, you know, and thinking about the waters of Rhode Island, you know, which was for many of you may not know, was the largest or the most significant slave trade state in America. Little Rhode Island, smallest state in the country, you know, shipped more than a thousand expeditions. So again, we go back to the same thing, which is the question I ask my students or I ask myself whenever I engage with a project. How do we use words? How do we think about the words that we use? How do we think about the fact that 55% in 1830 of kids sort of mill workers in Rhode Island were children. So we engage with this kinds of work graphically, you know, thinking about that, but also with projects. And we don't have time to get into that, but I want to emphasize the significance of what we can do as architects to create spaces that are not memorials, but they are places for studies, museums, you know, and how do we engage with our own experience in space? That's partly kind of almost like a pedagogical approach to issues of memory. How do we address things that we may not know? How do we think about space in that context? And again, how can we shake the foundations of what we see, like Linden Place, the most significant house in Bristol, Rhode Island, where our university is located, which was the, the owners of this house were the, the Wall family, which was the second richest family in the United States in the 1800s you know, and they were major slave traders. So the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies, you know, when we thought about this project in a historic district in the city of Worcester, you know, I thought of it as a library attached to a Victorian colonial revival house. So I thought of a house that has to somehow suggest the idea of inhabitation or an un uninhabitable memory. A zinc box next to the Victorian revival house. The interior opens to the, to, the, to the old structure, the interior of the library, you know, and there's always the idea of empty shelves that will be, you know, for books that will still have to be written, you know, and will never be written. Continuities, you see the continuity of the water table as a line and as a datum of, of the materials, you know, that make us think of a word that is estrangement, estranging the house that existed you know, yet doing it to construct certain dialogues and certain relations. You see, scale relations, proportional relations, and also spatial relations. This is not about a place in which the horror of the Holocaust will be, you know, sort of represented, but it's a place in which this will be discussed. And at the center of the project, there is a tree about life. And you will see in other projects the same concept or similar concepts. Estrangement, you know, is a project that I wanted to share briefly with you, which is a public space project or a public art project by artist, uh, Costa Rican artist Priscilla Monge, and is the house in a Le Lewandorf roundabout in Austria, near Vienna. The idea of the unheimlich, you know, Freudian uncanny, the uncanny, and a house that does not look like a house. Again, the principle or the idea of estrangement, you know, that comes to, to mind. At the Holocaust Museum in Buenos Aires, we created a space for testimonies of survivors, you know, surrounded by the presence of objects that simply tell a story. Testimonies of survivors surrounded by objects. At the National Holocaust Monument in Canada, in Ottawa, what we propose on the site, you know, is basically to excavate the totality of the place to reach bedrock. This is the site, you know, across the Canadian War Museum, you know, uh, in Ottawa, you know, and the project basically what we are proposing on that particular, we propose on that particular site, you know, that you see here was to excavate to bedrock. You know, that's kind of the stone, limestone, that is about a third of all Canadian shelf is that limestone. And we had the boring samples, you know, to define where that bedrock was. So the project was to create a topo topography at the level of bedrock you know, and to create a space that somehow interrupts the horizon, you know, of those who come and visit. The interruption of horizon and the relation to the capital in Ottawa in Canada, you know, with the presence, sorry, of this grove of aspen trees, 
You know, you can see here the ground, you know, becomes the story. And partly what we want to emphasize is the fact that this ground, the Canadian shelf, was a place where Jews were not allowed to enter. Only 5,000 Jews, you know, were able to get there between 1933 and 48. Now, Canada is a place for refugees, but at that time, Canada rejected all refugees, including, as, I, as, I, as I'm told, you know, the applications of my family that tried to escape, you know, as well. So the notion was to create this new ground, a ground that will invite the growth. And again, these projects are not about representations of horror, but are invitations to consider the significance of life, the significance of life, you know, as you can see here. The ground itself, this is an image of Auschwitz when I visited, the ground itself, you know, had to do with recollection of grounds that were, were going to be brought to the place, you know, as a kind of commemorative ceremony annually to help plant the trees. And these are all small states, small towns, you know, in Belarus, Lithuania, Ukraine, you know, where Jews, some of them were Jews, they were able to leave. And again, marking that place in the middle of Ottawa. And the next quick project that I want to share with you is a project that deals with 9-11, you know, and a few years ago, I was able to visit, you know, Bologna for a, for, for a project and a conference, actually, you know, part of the Rom, the European Observatory of Memories, you know, and, and I saw these towers and I was extremely su surprised by the sheer presence at, and scale of these pieces there. And obviously, one recalls the Twin Towers. And a few years ago, we were invited to do a project in, in Denver that, that basically uh, asked us to bring some of the steel from the World Trade Center to Denver, a commemorative space in a park that we were also part of the master plan of that park. And this is how we saw the steel on the ground at the Hangar 17 at JFK Airport. Now we decided that it was extremely significant to bring the steel to Denver, as we saw it in the hangar. Horizontal pieces, 36 feet long, foot long, pieces of structure that were transformed, you know, by the sheer, you know, uh, violence of that particular day and that particular moment in our lives. And we can see the effects of that story still in our present. But what we wanted to do is to bring those pieces of steel, you know, that we selected to Denver and to place them on a horizontal ground, similar to the way that we saw it, you know, at the Hangar 17. I will continue with briefly sharing with you some ideas about the project for Martin Luther King, you know, in Boston Common. And as you can see, many of these projects are ideas, are concepts. We were finalists and, you know, perhaps the jury made decisions that were not that we would the, you know we would be able to to build them but all of them are projects that make us think about the significance of ground the significance of history and the significance of life and when we think of martin luther king and coretta king you know coretta scott king memorial we think of a dual monument a monument of two figures you know or two significant uh, you know people in 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 american and and, and universe and and, and kind of an, and world life, you know, their voice, their, their, their speech, their action transformed this country and transformed the world, you know, and that's why we call this project the ripple effects, the ripple effects that have to do with the effects, you know, of the words, deeds, and actions that both Coretta and Martin Luther King, you know, had in our societies. Again, we think of ripples of, 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 of voice, you know, of love, nonviolence, fellowship, community, justice, and action. And we, are in, in, we were interested in the idea that their prophetic commitment, powerful words and calls for action, will not only reach the hearts and minds of great numbers of people, but also that they will in turn spread and disseminate such words among their families, social circles, and beyond. Again, words have ripples. Words have effects. So the project is to create what we call a ground for activism. It's a transformation topography of the Boston Common near the State House, the uh, Boston Common that was basically created in 1634. And we transformed topographically this project to allow or to present this idea of a ground for activism, a ground for activism where we have to consider 
the words of Angela Davis. I am no longer accepting the things that I cannot change. I am changing the things I cannot accept. And I hope we all will engage with this specifically at this point in our own lives here in the United States. Because as Frederick Douglass said, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. That's why we have to struggle because we have to you know, address the situations that we're living in today. Again, a ground for activism in the middle of Boston Common. The project has a, a geographic and historic context, as you can see on this image, you know, the Black Heritage Trail uh, landmarks, you know, the Freedom Trail in Boston and the march, this, the 1965 march from Martin Luther King that went from Roxbury you know, in Boston to the State House to give a historic speech at the State House. So this, this is what we call the elements of the project have what we call a memorial ground, a transformation of topography, which is the mound, the ripple effects, the bridge and the beacon towers. You know, and that's the space. And this project was designed, you know, again, as, as Professor Bro said at the beginning, we designed with Christoph Odichko, with uh, Marianne Thompson, a dear friend and architect, that here in, in, in Boston, in Boston, in Arlington, or in Cambridge, and a uh, dear friend and colleague, Walter Hood, who is professor at, uh, in Berkeley, in, 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 and, and, and uh, his practice is in Oakland. The concept here is not only to create that space, but to create this place. You see the glass and you will see materials that you have seen before, glass, concrete, and stone, and grass, and wood. But the idea here is to create the sense of a double, we see ourselves in the middle of the words that were uttered by King and Coretta Scott King, but also some other you know, significant figures in the civil rights movement. Seeing ourselves in the words and seeing ourselves in the context and in the company of others is very important to create not only community, but also to see ourselves in the midst of the significant change that this project can, can bring about in terms of activism in Boston. You know, and as we see, you see the topographic change on the lower section, and you see the memorial as active public space. Different kinds of conditions, you know, for public space and have to do with activation. As you saw, the memorial in Nantes being activated. Coretta King told us that freedom is never really won. You earn it and win it in every generation. And this is a very important thing because the struggle today is, is key. We have to think of earning democracy and winning it in every generation. You know, and I say this with utmost respect, you know, for the significance of this particular moment we're living in. You know, we have to earn democracy, and that means to participate and to vote. So let me get closer to concluding, you know, with showing some images of the project in Nantes. The Memorial to the Abolition of Slavery, is a public space and entails a complex project. We call it, we call this kind of, we think of it as actually a work as a working memorial and provides space and means for remembering and thinking about slavery and slave trade, commemorate resistance and abolitionist struggle, you know, and celebrate the historic act of abolition and also bringing the visitor closer to a struggle against present day forms of slavery. Let me quote here, the mayor of a city who was our direct you know, client and responsible and then was prime minister of France. And he said that this memorial is a genuine call to us all to remember past struggles in order to project ourselves into the future, fighting against all modern forms of slavery and denial of human rights in order to build a more united world. You know, again, thinking about past and present, the significance of slavery today and traffic today. Traffic in the past, traffic in the present. It's very important to understand the significance and legacies of the past and how they continue in our present in the United States, in Europe, and in the world. We are responsible for to, to make the world better. That means to face and to face the challenges, you know, and accept the challenges and responsibility that, that comes with it. And again, the space, the underground space that you saw many images about. And this is the site. Again, it was a parking lot and before was the port of the city of Nantes. And this is next to the Loire River, you know, and it's across the building that I showed you many times, Jean Nouvel Palace of Justice, you know, that is here. The memorial is here, which is about 400 meters long or so. 
and is also connected to the Museum of History of Nantes and through a kind of a walk in the city that marks the places where traffic and, and traffickers lived and how they commerce you know, with, 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 with enslaved humans. So it's very important to understand this in the context of a city and understand this in the context of, you know, of, of Europe. Again, the site, and you see the plan, and you see the image of the Palace of Justice on the bottom of the screen. The project adapts a space, again, is about 350 meters long. Sorry about that, it's about three and a half football fields long. You know, and the space here is the embankment of the 18th, 19th, and 20th century. The 20th century structure, the concrete structure that you saw, was, was designed and constructed by Hennebeek affiliates, you know, developing a new technique for construction of concrete. You know, and you see the passage and you see the section. You know, this, this is what we saw, you know, and this is what we adapted to become the memorial. That it went from parking, you know, an underground space to inhabitable space, as you see in the diagrams on the, on the, on the screen. Before and after, before, before on the bottom and after, before and after, and the transformation of that space. And the meaning of this space happens when visit, visitors engage with the words, engage with those declarations against slavery. You know, about 400 years of declarations against slavery that go from Toussaint Louverture or, or Ouida Ikiano to Toni Morrison and Martin Luther King. Those words inscribed in that glass that does not reflect, as you will see in a moment. The glass that cuts the ground and transforms a public space in the city of Nantes. You know? the glass that absorbs and emits light in a different way, depending on the time of the day and depend, depend on the light, you know, how it bounces. But Nantes, again, as I said before, was the capital of French slave trade, which means that it was the largest slave trade city in, the, in, in, in France with about, you know, 1,800 expeditions, you know, slave trade expeditions. So we thought of this and we saw the archives of the city and we saw the names of, of French slave, uh, slave trade you know, expeditions, and we thought a lot about the significance of, of this particular place in the context of its history. So we decided to think of the ground as a ground that can tell a history. And we invited visitors in the present to read, not only to think, but to read names. And you see this, what you could call beautiful names for slave ships, La Therese. But below that, you see here, Navir Negrier, which is a slave ship or a, slave or, or a ship where enslaved humans were carried. You know, you know a, sleep is, is a ship where enslaved humans were carried. That is called Lamour. Can you believe that it, there's, there's one of them that's called Love? So you begin to see the significance again of this ground, a ground that we call, that we think of, of it as, as a ground that can tell a history, can tell a history. And I would like to invite all of you to think of the grounds that you inhabit and what are the stories that we do not know or we do not see. You know, every city is a repository of layers and layers and layers and layers of history. Part of our project is to excavate that history. And suddenly I found names like my grandmother, Carlota, Charlotte, Lottie, we call her, we call her, Oma Lottie, my grandmother. And underground, you begin to see the space you know, that we found, you know, which is the wall of the 18th and 19th century marked by the structure of the, of the 20th century and our design of a concrete, as you see on the right. The textures that for us as architects and artists were, were, were very important. But all this project started with a sketch, and this is partly what I wanted to suggest. When I asked you about to think about the layers of histories you know, that the ground, you know, can be hiding, let's put it this way, I suggested that we excavate the whole site and to create an open to the sky space. You know, and suddenly we saw in the documents of the city that that space that we imagined actually existed. And we got these documents, as you see here, from the city that show the construction of the ports of 18, 19, and 20th century. You see, you know, actually the 18th century is a little bit further behind. And the project became to adapt this particular space. And this is our visit, you know, with Christopher Odichko underground, you know, and this is the space, and this is a space as it had to be transformed because the, the, the river, as you will see, you know, 
basically has a tide, which is about 12 feet twice a day. So the space that you see here was always flooded, you know, actually twice a day flooded. So we had to create a dam, a very complex construction under the structure that existed to be able to inhabit it. And still the space has to be protected against the flooding, you know, that happens, you know. And you see on the right, you see this glass is actually a, you know, a, a kind of a acrylic, you know, uh, aquarium grade acrylic that would only allow the water, it's protecting actually to the, to the, to the level of the 10 year flood. So it has not flooded yet, very close, but the water goes up and down. So the space, it's marked by the presence of that glass wall that cuts the ground and emerges to the city. And it includes all this text that I was telling you about. But the significance of this space happens when people read, when people engage you know, with themselves and with their friends and with their, with, their, with their companies to discuss and to engage in conversations about the history and the memory of abolition and slavery, you know, uh, and to think of themselves as human, you know, as human beings, you know, that freely can get into the space. The day of the opening, and certain words that are marking the entrance or the, one of the main staircase, which are the Declaration of Human Rights, the Article 4, a portion of it that says, no one shall be held in slavery or servitude. Slavery, slavery and the slave trade shall be prohibited in all forms. So it's very significant to think of the words that go in a project like this. The word freedom inscribed in 47 languages and how this project cuts the ground of the city. Again, memory. The Sea is History by Derek Walcott, 1979, uh, Nobel Prize of, of Literature. But again, as I was telling you, you see the glass does not reflect. So our comp in our computer, we tested glass that reflects and we decided to create a glass that would not reflect so that the letters themselves are reflected, are reflective. It's very important to consider the materials and the technology that a project like this requires. Again, kind of calculating the position of the beams and the design of the graphics in the section, you know, on the glass, you know, that basically allows only a joint and no structure is visible. Again, the structure is behind, and we develop this with, you know, Arcadis and Rouleau, architects and, and engineers in France. And you see all the detailing that goes to this three layer, extremely large, extremely heavy glass. You know, these pieces are about seven feet wide, 15 feet long, twice, you know, one on top of each other in diagonal, you know. And people reading, people thinking, people looking at words, and again, the glass that cuts the ground. At the day and at night, you know, and again, we go back to these three Marys, you know, and as you move, you see the letters reflecting, and you move and the letters do not reflect. Words like new love, reflecting and non-reflecting and depends on how you move. And that's how we design the species on the ground. You know, happy Mary, happy Mary. But none of our projects, and I want to emphasize this, none of our projects, be that a house or be that a memorial or be that a hospital, can happen without caring hands. And those caring hands that build our projects, you know, are extremely not only important, but are these human beings that have the knowledge of how to do things. So we, as architects and architects to be, have to celebrate the, this, 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 this folks that, that basically make possible for us to construct our projects. Yes, I thought of the way of crafting the ground itself. I designed myself, I designed the method, you know, I proposed actually the method that was adapted by the construction company, but I would not be able to do it, you know. So carrying hands that cut the ground, carrying hands that seal the joints, Carrying ground that, that cut the concrete, you see in, in this way, carrying grounds that slide seven and a half ton precast concretes to create that wall that will support the glass. You see what I mean? None of our projects can happen without carrying hands. And we have to celebrate them and celebrate the meaning of their work in our own lives. And the light that reflects and bounces from the water, you know, on the water, on the river as we see it, you know and the water that filters when it rains, because it's open to the atmosphere, and the water that marks the words like revolt or freedom. And the materials and the details, you know, the way that the stone, you know, kind of is, 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 is mapped to be able to cut the wood. 
and the relation between a precast staircase that we design against the stone of the, of the 19th century. And you can see here the concrete cut. You see the rebar themselves. And again, the moments of reflection, you know, and the moments of thinking, the engagement of people in our project, with our project, actually. This project that invites reflection, invites commemoration, invites thinking, and invites action. It invites action, you know, like the schools that come daily, you know, more than 600 people come daily, three or four groups of schools from universities to kindergarten to come to this place to think about this history, you know. And people writing, people reading, people thinking, you know. My two sons a while ago, Manu and Martin, you know, visiting the memorial with us. And my visit with my father, you know, a, a long time ago or a few years ago, who's also an architect and still practices in Buenos Aires. And we see my sons, Martin and Manu. So these are very proud moments that we have as architects, perhaps unique in our lives. Christophe Odichko, Jean-Marc Ayrault, the mayor and then prime minister of France and myself. But this moment makes it even more, more happier to see actually, not happier, but actually moves me more, which is this embrace, this moment of three people that I do not know embracing and discussing and reading. Or a moment like my former student and collaborator and dear friend, Tom Long, you know, reading, you know, Martin Luther King's work, I have a dream. So this public space transformed the city, transformed the city because it's used and has been visited by a million and a half people. But that, those are numbers. The most significant thing that can happen is the visit of each single individual and the memorial during the day and at night, you know, and the memorial as seen from the Palace of Justice, you see the horizontal line of glass, and the Palace of Justice as seen from the memorial. Again, to get concluding, you know, this is the dynamic space, and it's a space that changes all the time. It's a space that changes with the atmosphere, and it's a space that changes all the time by the presence, the sheer presence of human beings, like this woman that was visibly moved and I saw her because I was just happened to be there, be visibly moved, reading the texts, each single text inscribed on the memorial, spent hours there. And suddenly I heard the footsteps of her young son. I mean, I imagine it's her young son, but basically I saw this embrace. And I felt very moved by the, by the sheer power of this embrace in the space that I simply contribute to identify, to design, and to create. So with that, I would like to stop here and leave you with this image, but I would like to sort of say that what I'm trying to do is to kind of create an approach to memory as an action, you know, to broaden the discussion about memory and buildings, and to reimagine, reimagine perhaps the practice and the pedagogy of architecture around these subjects. And there are many, many more works, and there's a movie, but I would like, perhaps it's a movie that is four minutes, and I'm not sure, uh, Professor Bros, if, if, uh, if we would be okay to show the four minute movie or we prefer to, to stop here. I think it's fine if you go ahead and show the movie. Okay, so I hope uh, uh, people are, are, are with us. Let me stop share and I'll show, share with you a very short movie you know, on, uh, on this project. Let me open, let me do share screen. Okay, here it is. Please tell me if you see it. Plus de 27 000 expéditions négrières ont été recensées au départ des ports européens entre le 15e et le 19e siècle. Elles arrachèrent plus de 12,5 millions d'hommes, femmes et enfants à la terre d'Afrique pour les réduire en esclavage en Amérique et aux Antilles. Plus d'1,5 million de personnes moururent pendant la traversée. You see a construction drawings and our visit to a construction site. And what I mentioned to you, you know, people visiting.
and you see a very special moment, which is in the mornings, you can see the reflection of the water upwards, you know, the sun reflecting on the ceiling and creating that very strange and very powerful vibration. The way the glass cuts the ground on the moment of the opening. L'esclave de l'esclavage est celui qui ne veut pas savoir. Edouard Bisson. That's the president of Benin, the prime minister. Lilian Turan, soccer player. Contre toutes les formes d'oppression, d'esclavage, d'exploitation humaine, de discrimination, ça reste un combat d'aujourd'hui. Comprendre notre histoire, comprendre les mécanismes de l'histoire, ça nous donne davantage d'élan, ça nous donne davantage de force pour le faire. So, what the mayor and prime minister were saying is that to understand the mechanisms of history will give us an advantage to continue the struggle for human rights today. Think about those words in the context of what we're living today. Understand the mechanisms of history, you know, how people talk about the past. How do we think about the past? How do we engage with the past? The past that is still present in our present. Love your hands, Toni Morrison told us. And that's inscribed at the memorial from Beloved. <laughs> pour se souvenir, pour comprendre, mais c'est aussi un lieu pour réfléchir pour aujourd'hui. Je me dis que c'est horrible, tous les gens qui sont morts dans des souffrances et les, les enfants qui sont obligés de travailler. Je lance ici, de Nantes, aujourd'hui, un appel solennel à tous les citoyens français à lutter sans faiblesse contre toute forme de racisme, d'antisémitisme, contre toute forme d'esclavage et d'exploitation de l'être humain dans le monde. Again, the window and this invitation to think of the memorial as an instrument for our present, for our conversations. Thinking about the past, thinking about the present. And this is Derek Walcott. The sea is history. The sea is history. The sea is history. With that, I would like to thank you all for taking the time and I would be more than happy to have a conversation, questions, and hopefully some responses to what, what we presented today.